While visiting my in-laws who live far away, my mother-in-law came to pick us up at the station in her car. My husband Phil got into the passenger seat first and as I tried to open the back seat door, I realized it was locked. Uh, mother, the door seems to be locked. As I said that to them through the car window, my mother-in-law and Phil looked at each other and started laughing. With a smile, my mother-in-law said, why should I let an incompetent woman who can't even do proper wife duties into the car? What? What do you mean? I never liked you from the start. You wear your career woman attitude on your face and don't support Phil at all. Hey, open the door. I demanded, but the door remained firmly locked. Then, Phil in the passenger seat said mockingly, this should make you rethink things a little. Walk three hours back home. At that moment, I couldn't take it anymore. What kind of parent-child pair is this? I won't follow you anymore. I don't care what happens. Fine. I replied, squeezing out my words. My mother-in-law and Phil laughed loudly, rolled up the windows, and drove off. An hour later, Phil called me repeatedly. I'm Katie Simpson, 31 years old and a working wife. I'm good at Spanish and work for a foreign company. My workplace is vibrant, and I spent my 20s devoted to my job. But soon I realized my 30s were approaching and felt a bit anxious about not having a boyfriend. Even so, I was hesitant to apply to a marriage agency. Instead, my daily routine was to visit my favorite bar after work to relax and think things over. One day, the bar owner approached me. What's wrong, Katie? You don't seem well. Ah, uh, maybe it's time I start thinking about marriage, but I can't find a partner. I see. I know it's strange to suggest this to a customer, but how about me? He proposed. What? This bar owner was Phil, who later became my husband. He was five years older than me and in his second year of running the bar. At first, we were just owner and customer. But after a few dates, I was drawn to Phil's charm. Since he listened to my work stories, I felt he understood my career and was reassured. Even during busy times, Phil always cared for me. A year into our relationship, he proposed to me, and I happily accepted. After that, my parents approved of the marriage, and we visited Phil's family. His family lives in the suburbs, a three-hour walk from the nearest station. We headed to his parents' apartment in a rented car. Phil's father had already passed away, and his mother lived alone in the apartment. Suppressing my nerves, I greeted his mother, Diane, respectfully. Nice to meet you. I'm Katie Simpson. I'm dating Phil, I said. But she stared at me and told Phil, Phil, are you really marrying her? I thought you'd bring home someone cuter. She looks like she's got a cheeky face, she pointed out. I was shocked by her words. And if you become his wife, can you help Phil with his work? He's always busy. You're quitting your job, right? She questioned. I hurriedly explained that I intended to continue working at my foreign company and had no plans to quit. You think you can be a wife like that? I don't care if you work for a foreign company, but you're just cheeky. Phil, don't marry this woman, she criticized. I looked at Phil for help, but he said, hey, hey, mom, Katie's salary is high. It's fine if she keeps working, right? Good income, huh? Well, if that's the case, I guess it can't be helped. Phil's words seemed to soften his mother, but I was still hurting. Even if you get married, don't slack off at work, she warned, and I felt troubled by her advice. Though she approved of our marriage, her words made me anxious. But with our home and her place being four hours apart, believing we'd have little contact with his strict mother, I decided to marry Phil. Afterward, we rented a three-room apartment near Phil's bar and began our newlywed life. However, Phil didn't help with any housework. He would come home after I had fallen into a deep sleep and sleep until noon. Even if I asked him to do some housework before leaving for work, he didn't help at all. Phil, you didn't do any chores again today. You used to live alone, so you should be able to handle basic housework. Shut up. Now that we're married, housework is the wife's job, right? Mom said the same thing. Don't neglect your wife duties. But you know how busy my job is, right? You think working for a foreign company makes you look cool? You can't control me just because you have a better job and education. Phil's words seemed to reveal his frustration about my higher educational background and career status. Where did the man who understood my career before marriage disappear to? With my head in my hands, I had no choice but to shoulder all the housework. A few months after our marriage, I came home to a shocking sight. My mother-in-law had shown up and announced, Mother, is something wrong? What? Didn't Phil tell you? I'll be staying here for the next three months to assess how well you do as a wife. What? Phil, what is this about? I looked at Phil, but he casually replied, Uh, did I forgot to mention it? And so, living with my mother-in-law began starting a painful chapter in my life. Every morning, 
Only I would be woken up early to do housework under her watchful eye. Fish for dinner? Are you treating me like an old lady? Even when I prepared dinner, she would criticize it daily. Sometimes, she would even throw away the food I'd put so much effort into making. After working late, I'd return home to find my mother-in-law blocking the entrance. What are you trying to prove by coming home this late? Don't forget my son is the one making the money. Because of this, I had to listen to her constant nagging. While she treated me like a servant, she often asked me for money. Katie, I want to see a musical show. Could you give me the ticket money? That's quite a sudden request. Come on, I'm in the big city, so you should let me have a little fun. Why are you being so stingy? At times like this, Phil would chime in, come on, it's not a big deal. Just give her some money. At my wit's end, I argued back, there's no way I can give you that kind of money. This is too much. It seemed this was the first time she'd been opposed, and though she tried to say something back, I ignored her and locked myself in my room. In the end, Phil reluctantly gave her the money. She took it and left without hesitation. As time passed, the amount of money she asked for kept increasing. Naturally, we're covering all the household expenses. She'd ask for money when it suited her, was always sarcastic and made a mess of the house. Unable to tolerate the situation any longer, I brought it up with Phil one day. Phil, the way your mom treats me is just too much. You need to take action as my husband. But Phil, visibly angry, said, what are you talking about? Are you planning to criticize my mom? No, that's not what I. You think you're superior to me and mom just because you earn more, don't you? I can see right through you. What are you even saying? I don't understand. While I was confused, Phil calmly said, Mom isn't wrong about anything. You're a bad wife, so she's training you. If you continue to criticize her, I'll take measures. What do you mean by measures? At that moment, Phil took out a divorce form, already filled out, and slammed it on the table. Phil, what's this? If you don't comply, I'll divorce you. A woman as inappealing as you will be left alone once you're not with me. And who's the one nobody wants around? You're ridiculous. When I counted, Phil was lost for words and left the room with a snort. I no longer felt any love for Phil. I couldn't forgive his behavior. But simple revenge wouldn't mean much. So, I decided to wait for the right opportunity. After the promised three months, his mother finally left. Still, my relationship with Phil remained strained. He continued to refuse to help with the housework and only spoke to me harshly. I gradually grew to dislike speaking to Phil altogether. Time passed and as the Christmas approached, Phil decided on his own, we're going to my parents' place for Christmas this year. Since we were married, I had no choice but to comply, so I reluctantly agreed. On the day of the trip, we took the train. While visiting the in-laws who live far away, my mother-in-law came to pick us up at the station in her car. Phil got into the passenger seat first and as I tried to open the backseat door, I realized it was locked. Uh, mother. The door seems to be locked. As I said that to them through the car window, my mother-in-law and Phil looked at each other and started laughing. Why should I let an incompetent woman who can't even do proper wife duties into the car? What? What do you mean? I never liked you from the start. You wear your career woman attitude on your face and don't support Phil at all. Hey, open the door. I demanded, but the door remained firmly locked. Then, Phil in the passenger seat said mockingly, This should make you rethink things a little. Walk three hours back home. At that moment, I couldn't take it anymore. What kind of parent-child pair is this? I won't follow you anymore. I don't care what happens. Fine. I replied, squeezing out my words. My mother-in-law and Phil laughed loudly, rolled up the windows, and drove off. I just silently watched their car drive away. Well then, let's head back, I murmured to myself. And I returned to the station instead of going back to her place. I'd never go back there again. No matter how angry my mother-in-law and Phil would get, I didn't care anymore. I managed to find an open seat on the train and quickly left the area. An hour had passed since I had separated from my husband. Then, my phone started ringing. The caller was Phil. I ignored it and put my phone in my coat pocket. The calls kept coming, almost like a relentless pursuit. Unable to bear it any longer, I stepped out onto the train deck and answered the call. Hello, I said. You finally picked up. Where are you? Phil asked in a panicked voice. Keeping my composure, I asked, What's with all the calls? What's going on? So, after that, we decided to go for a drive and head back home. And I took mom to a tourist spot. On the way, we had an accident, he replied. An accident? What do you mean? We both got minor injuries. But the other party is a foreigner, really angry, and we can't communicate. You're good at Spanish, so could you come to mediate? 
Phil asked frantically. I see. Are you really listening? The other car looks very expensive, and the driver is yelling in Spanish. Hurry up and come here. Where are you walking right now? Phil said. I'm not walking, I replied. What? Actually, I'm on the train right now. We're about to enter a tunnel, so the signal might cut off. What the hell? Are you kidding me? Are you heading back home? Phil shouted, but I hung up immediately. Even though the tunnel was a lie, I smiled coolly. After returning home and packing my belongings, I quickly moved into a short-stay rental apartment. Once that was done, I headed to a certain place. After the Christmas holiday ended and the first working day of the year arrived, I left the office to find my mother-in-law with crutches and Phil with a neck brace, waiting for me. What are you two doing? I asked with a scowl and both turned red in the face. There's no one at home and you're not answering your phone. What on earth have you been doing? Unforgivable. They yelled so to avoid causing a scene. I led them to a nearby cafe. Why did you not come last time? And you call yourself a wife? My mother-in-law began to shout, but I ordered coffee and chose to ignore her. Phil couldn't hide his anger and said, because you didn't come back. We had all sorts of trouble afterward. The police came, and in the end, we had to speak directly to the other party. They're foreigners, and not being able to communicate was a problem. Really? I replied. I'll overlook your attitude. So just go and talk to them quickly. They're calling again. With a pushy attitude, Phil handed me the phone. Reluctantly, I answered the call, had a brief conversation with the other party, and ended the call. Phil asked me, so, what did they say? I calmly responded, they were really angry. Apparently, your mother ignored a red light and crashed into the other car. And the other party is a famous international celebrity, demanding compensation for medical expenses and the totaled car. That car is worth $300,000. What? Phil and his mother exclaimed in shock, their voices echoing in the room. They seemed speechless, unable to hide their surprise at the information. Well, can't you handle it with insurance? I lightly suggested, but my mother-in-law's face darkened immediately. Um, actually, we don't have insurance. I thought it was a waste of money, she muttered. Oh my, I said with a bitter smile, sensing the atmosphere change. Phil showed his anger toward me and said, What's with that attitude? That's not how a wife should act. Quickly talk to them and make sure there are no additional costs. If it goes to court, you'll be our interpreter. Then, my mother-in-law chimed in, Yes, you're rich, so you should help out with this. It's only natural as a wife. I calmly responded, I'm not a wife anymore. What? Phil looked surprised, but I proceeded to explain the facts matter-of-factly. When Phil presented the divorce form to pressure me, my heart had already gone cold. I swiftly went to the courthouse and filed the divorce papers. I had kept the form Phil had used for leverage in case anything happened. What? You? How could you do this on your own? Phil exclaimed in shock. How disrespectful. His mother accused. Both of them criticized me simultaneously, but I stood my ground and confidently rebutted, I have nothing to do with you anymore. We're just strangers now. You can suffer paying the $300,000 or whatever. You horrible people. I walked away, leaving them fuming with anger. As for what happened afterward, I heard that both eventually made a full recovery from their injuries. Apparently, they weren't that seriously injured in the first place. My former mother-in-law's car was broken beyond repair due to the accident, and the famous foreign celebrity demanded an unimaginable amount in compensation. Phil's bar was never particularly successful, and his income alone was insufficient to support their household. With Phil's low income and his mother living unemployed in an apartment, they had no way to come up with the necessary funds and eventually had to go into debt. Phil moved back to his parents' home, and the two now lived together in a shabby apartment, working hard to repay their debt. Even after hearing these stories, I don't feel any sympathy for them. On the contrary, I even feel a sense of relief. Several years have passed since the divorce, and I've been living alone, focusing on my work. As a result, my stress has decreased and my performance at work has improved, leading to a promotion. Recently, a sincere and reliable man I met through work formally asked to date me with marriage in mind. I intend to accept his proposal. From now on, I'll put myself first and pursue true happiness. That's it. You've been using the $500 I sent for living expenses for fun, haven't you? Jason shouted loudly as he returned home. Could he be lying even more, not satisfied with just exploiting me? As I heard his voice, anger also welled up in my heart. Jason was a problem. 
He surely had no intention of listening to me. My love for Jason, who ignored my words and said things as he pleased, cooled rapidly. Do you have any intention of listening to me? I don't want to hear your excuses. Either return the money you spent immediately, or divorce. What? Then it's divorce. I answered with a smile. Right after that, the front door opened. It seemed my son Kevin had come home. It's wrong to blame mom. What? Are you defending this woman? She has. That's exactly why you both lost my trust. Seeing the person who appeared behind Kevin, we were surprised. Thanks to his support, I was able to divorce Jason. And by stopping the remittances, they will be put in a difficult situation. I, Tracy Manning, 37 years old, am a normal part-time office worker and a mother with a son, Kevin, who is in the midst of his rebellious phase. Kevin, ever since he was young, liked his studies and would voluntarily do his homework and prepare for lessons without my prompting. As he entered his rebellious phase, he gradually began to ignore me. However, he never used harsh words or violence. When he became a high school student, I felt this was normal. More difficult than my son were my husband Jason and my mother-in-law, Diane. I met Jason in college and we started dating due to his proactive approach. After graduating, Kevin was born and we got married. How rude to have a shotgun wedding, my mother-in-law criticized. She loved Jason very much and probably thought I took him away. I endured her mistreatment. Sometimes it even endangered the my pregnancy. At such times, my father-in-law Michael would save us, saying, What are you doing? My father-in-law is strict but kind-hearted, a benefactor who has supported us many times. I keep in touch with my father-in-law, but I keep my distance from my mother-in-law. Honestly, I don't want to get involved with her. Then one day, I got an unpleasant call from my mother-in-law. Hey, could you increase the remittance a bit? Actually, we were financially supporting her. Once, Jason suggested we live together. However, citing unresolved issues from the past mistreatment and Kevin's examination period, I refused. Then, Jason and his mother strongly criticized me. Not wanting to live together is inappropriate for a wife. My mother-in-law said, always dwelling on the past. Jason also said, wait, does living together mean I have to change my desired school? Kevin changed the situation with those words. Kevin, as the heir, was pampered by my mother-in-law. If I don't go to that school, my future will be jeopardized. Do you intend to hinder my dreams? If so, I'll never forgive you. Because of Kevin's words, my mother-in-law had nothing to say. Jason also silently looked at his mother. It was also helpful that my father-in-law was on our side. If you don't value your family, you might lose your job, he warned Jason. My father-in-law runs a company where I work part-time. Jason is the nominal successor, but his lack of work skills is well known. Even I, a part-timer, hear about Jason's incompetence. It's that famous. I think his current position is due to my father-in-law's mercy. Understanding this, Jason stopped mentioning living together. Given this background, we decided to provide financial support instead of living together. I don't feel the need to provide support, but please let me at least do this for my parents, begged Jason, so I accepted it. Jason is lazy. So in reality, I am the one sending the $500 he gave me directly to my mother-in-law. I think there's no need for financial support with your husband's income, but it's for my husband. Just send it quickly without complaints. My mother-in-law insisted over the phone. Arguing would only make my mother-in-law angrier. Until now, Kevin and my father-in-law have been supportive. But now Kevin is in adolescence, and my father-in-law is busy with an important project. It's hard to ask for help. Despite this, my mother-in-law's persistent demands for more money continued, so I decided to add another $300 from my part-time income. Just $300? Well, okay. I've increased the amount, so please don't make unnecessary contact anymore. I firmly warn my cheerful mother-in-law. Keeping distance from my mother-in-law was best, but I couldn't forget my father-in-law's kindness. I plan to endure until Kevin becomes independent. I'm back.
Welcome back. After that, I planned to talk to Jason, who had just returned home, about the increased financial support. But Jason avoided even looking at me. Irritated by him, I still tried to have an important conversation. I want to talk a little. Enough, I'm tired. I'm going to take a bath, he said and headed straight to the bath. Picking up the socks and tie Jason left strewn about, I sighed, what's wrong? A voice came from behind and I turned around in surprise to see Kevin, also looking surprised. That startled me. Kevin, it's been a while since he spoke to me, so I was surprised. Uh, sorry about that. I didn't mean to startle you. It's okay. Did something happen? We talked for the first time in a long time. I was so happy, I ended up telling him everything. Being ignored by your own husband is indeed painful. Meanwhile, Kevin listened to my story, seemingly deep in thought. Maybe grandma. Hey, I'm done with the bath. Time for dinner. While Kevin was about to say something, Jason returned to the living room. So, Kevin stopped speaking and went back to his room. Feeling like I missed a precious moment with my child, I served dinner to Jason. Hey, I have something I want to talk about. Even while eating. What? Fish? Not meat. The moment I tried to start a conversation, Jason complained about the meal. You said you wanted fish today. But more importantly, that was this morning, right? Now I feel like eating meat. A wife should sense these things. I don't have ESP. You know, I go shopping after work, right? You should tell me before then. Shut up. You're a failure as a wife. Why did I have to be criticized like this? When I argued back, Jason became more dissatisfied, leading to a marital argument, and I couldn't bring up the topic of financial support. At that time, I didn't realize that Kevin was recording us with his smartphone. Sigh, father-in-law is really a good person. I muttered to myself alone in the living room. To be honest, I had to express it out loud to cope with the stress. My mother-in-law sighed, a younger Jason used to consider my health and help with housework. That's why I decided to marry him. But after Kevin was born, everything changed. While I struggled with Kevin's upbringing, he didn't support me at all, continuously criticizing, mom would do it this way, mom would be perfect. Thoughts of divorce came and went in my mind. I pondered over the future alone after such events. Around the time Kevin started his summer vacation. During that period, Jason completely ignored me. It was the same behavior as Kevin during his rebellious phase. Is he really a mature adult? There's something important. Come to our parents' house. One day, our family was called to my in-law's house. It was sudden, and I had work, and Kevin had other plans, so I sent Jason alone. Jason looked a bit displeased, but took a leave and went by himself. Kevin was also getting ready to leave. Kevin, where are you going? Friends. Yeah, that's right. Okay, take care. Don't be too late. So, Kevin and I left the house separately. While at work, I heard that Jason's absence increased work efficiency, and I unconsciously smiled. When I returned home, no one had come back yet, and I started preparing dinner, wondering if I would be criticized that day. Suddenly, hey, Tracy. Jason yelled as he entered through the front door. What happened, Jason? You seem so upset. You've been deceiving me. With doubtful eyes, Jason shouted at me. What? Not understanding his words, I tilted my head and Jason glared at me with anger. Confused, I understood the situation from Jason's next words. We're getting a divorce. You've been playing with the $500 I gave you for living expenses. As soon as he came home, Jason began his angry tirade. Listening to Jason, anger also welled up in my heart. Jason was out of line. Seeing his behavior, he clearly had no intention of listening to me. Jason's attitude of unilaterally throwing words without listening to me rapidly cold my affection for him. Don't you intend to listen to me? I don't want to hear your excuses. Either return the money you spent immediately or divorce. What? Then divorce it is. I spoke with a gentle smile and then the front door opened. It seemed Kevin had come home. It's wrong to blame mom. What? You're defending this woman? She has to. That's exactly why you have lost our trust. 
We were surprised by the person who appeared behind Kevin. Father, Dad, why are you here with Kevin? There stood my father-in-law, filled with indignation. What are you doing? Uh, well, um, explain quickly. When my father-in-law asked in a stern tone, Jason immediately stumbled over his words. My father-in-law gazed at him sternly while Kevin took out his smartphone. I recorded all of Dad's behavior towards Mom, including our recent conversation. This will show everyone that Dad is wrong. What? When Kevin said that, Jason looked utterly shocked. I won't allow you to make Mom the villain, and if you try to hurt her, I'm prepared to take you down, Dad. Kevin is athletic and well-built, while Jason has recently started to develop a belly, a typical middle-aged man. The difference in strength was clear. You're defying your father? What kind of father are you talking about? A father who follows grandmother's every word and ignores mom's opinions? Even when I ignored her, mom was always sincere towards me. But what are you doing as a father? Is making mom suffer your job as a father? Jason remained silent at Kevin's calm words. Children grow up before you know it. Despite this situation, I was sincerely happy that Kevin was protecting me. Jason, remember what I said earlier about what happens to a man who doesn't value his family? My father-in-law said this, and Jason's face turned pale. A natural reaction. It's as if he's saying he's about to fire him. Mom, here. This is. A divorce form? What I was handed was a divorce form. Why did Kevin have this? I never expected such preparations. You don't have to worry about me. Encouraged by Kevin's words, I quickly filled in my part and handed it to Jason. Without hesitation, Jason signed the divorce form and then looked at me, surprised. What? Are you sure? Won't you be in trouble if we get divorced? I'll manage. It's easier than living with you. And no more troubles with your mother. But you have no choice but to sign the divorce form. Sign it now. Jason hesitated slightly, but under my father-in-law's stern gaze, he signed the divorce documents, looking dejected. Kevin, pack up. We're going to my parents' house. Got it. After that, we quickly packed our things and headed to my parents' house, sent off by my father-in-law. Jason, who tried to follow us, was glared at by Kevin and my father-in-law, stopping him in his tracks. We decided to stop by the city hall on the way to submit the divorce form. I'm truly glad Kevin and my father-in-law came back together. They made it possible for me to divorce Jason smoothly. What about the financial support? Of course, I'm stopping it. Stopping the financial support would definitely change their situation. Upon arriving at my parents' house, they welcomed us warmly, despite the sudden visit. After ensuring we were okay, my father-in-law went home. Hey Kevin, why were you with grandfather? Choosing a calm moment, I asked Kevin. Actually, I had a meeting planned with grandpa today. It turned out his plan for the day was to talk with my father-in-law. Kevin had told my father-in-law about the financial support and Jason's daily behavior after hearing about it from me. They had made plans to meet to discuss future strategies. It turned out that my father-in-law didn't know the details of the financial support. Come to think of it, my father-in-law was absent when the financial support was decided. The topic of financial support came up after my father-in-law had left the room. The subsequent arrangements were made over the phone with my mother-in-law. I would tell my husband, and my husband understands, she said, but maybe that was a mistake. And when Kevin told my father-in-law about the situation, he seemed to be trembling with anger. Diane should have sufficient funds from me. What is she spending the money on? As a result, my father-in-law apparently conducted an investigation into my mother-in-law's activities. What became clear was my mother-in-law's wasteful spending habits. She had been using the financial support we sent for extensive shopping. During my mother-in-law's absence, a search of the storage revealed countless branded items and luxury jewelry. Moreover, it seemed she had been giving lavish gifts to attractive young men in the neighborhood. The men showed no interest in my mother-in-law, and I wouldn't seriously date a man much older than me either. The rejected gifts were left unopened in the storage because she couldn't deal with them, and my father-in-law disposed of them. Grandpa is divorcing grandma. 
He was furious about her irresponsibility. I can imagine. My father-in-law decided to divorce my mother-in-law and, after seeing Jason's actions on Kevin's phone, he was further enraged. He returned with Kevin to encourage me to divorce Jason too, after deciding to get divorced himself. They encountered the scene of me being criticized and immediately urged for the divorce papers to be signed after hearing me declare I wanted a divorce. That's why everything was so prepared. Exactly. This is from Grandpa. Kevin handed me a brochure about a property. The property was of moderate size, located midway between the school and my workplace. It seemed a bit far from my in-law's house. What does this mean? I asked. Grandpa wants to offer us this house as an apology for the recent situation, Kevin explained. I was wide-eyed with surprise. While I would have to drive from my parents' house, I could commute using regular routes from this new house. Grandpa said he doesn't want us to hesitate. It seems he'd be happier if we accepted the house. I see, I need to thank him later. I was impressed by such generosity, typical of a CEO. I gratefully accepted the house offered by my father-in-law. Eventually, Jason lost his job, not only because of this incident but also because he exposed his incompetence by leveraging his position as the CEO's son and caused various problems. He was pushing off the little work he was assigned, coercing young female employees into relationships and harassing male employees. During the discussion of these issues, testimonies piled up, resulting in Jason's immediate dismissal. My mother-in-law, divorced by my father-in-law and kicked out of the house, apparently ended up at Jason's place. After the settlement of asset division and child support, Jason's savings were almost depleted, and he was hit with the misfortune of losing his job. Recently, I saw Dad working at a classmate's part-time job, being scolded. Really? Did that classmate say anything special? I asked. Yeah. He said, a man like your dad came in. I told him not to hesitate to be strict if he's not useful. Kevin replied. I see, that's how it is. Being continuously scolded by his son's classmate, what a pitiful situation. He was famous for his incompetence and, as he aged, his prospects for re-employment became even more difficult. On top of that, with my mother-in-law's unreformed spending habits, he is now struggling with debt. I heard from locals that fighting can be heard from their house daily, and recently, the police were called due to the disturbance. That incident must have been a significant humiliation for him. Perhaps soon, he might have to leave that house, facing the possibility of being evicted due to mortgage delinquency. On one hand, I made progress in my career. My promotion to a full-time position meant more time and responsibility, but it also came with a corresponding increase in income. Life became a bit more comfortable compared to before and I no longer had to worry about the monthly financial support. After hearing about Jason's situation, Kevin started showing interest in part-time work. Now, he buys what he wants with his own earnings, freeing us a bit from the strict budget we used to have. His growth and independence are a great relief to me. Unlike my mother-in-law, who had a habit of wasteful spending, we continue to live frugally, eliminating worries about the future. Our family is striving for a stable financial life. My relationship with my father-in-law remains good, and we see each other regularly. One day, my father-in-law made an unexpected proposal to Kevin. If you haven't decided on your future plans yet, how about considering taking over my business after graduation? I'd like you to play a key role in our company, he said. It seems my father-in-law has always considered Kevin as a successor to the company. Maybe employing Jason was part of this plan to spark Kevin's interest. There's no need to rush. If you don't find another dream by the time you graduate from college, I'd like you to consider our business as an option, my father-in-law said and Kevin took his words seriously. Kevin, you can choose your own path. Don't worry about the favor. I'll solve it through my work, I told him. Thanks, Mom. Actually, I'm still undecided about my future, Kevin replied. He's aiming for a top university's economics department, but his future is still unclear. Then, one day, I received a call from Jason. 
He was struggling with the mortgage payments and ended up selling the house. I was just astonished by Jason, who left my mother-in-law behind. I understood that Jason was walking the path he chose, but I was still disappointed by his actions. You won't have any more trouble with my mom. Let's start over, Tracy. Kevin needs a real father, Jason said, to which I sharply reacted. What do you have left now? I asked, and he just looked puzzled. Through this exchange, I reconsidered my and my son's future. Our lives aren't dictated by someone else's choices. No matter what path Kevin chooses, I plan to support him fully. While my father-in-law's offer is appreciated, I want Kevin to choose his future on his own terms. I hope his university studies will bring new possibilities to his life and shape his dreams and aspirations. We will continue to move forward step by step, overcoming difficulties. Along with my son's growth, I may have also started a new journey. You have no job, no property, no home. Kevin and I have no feelings left for you. You even abandoned your mother, the only one you had left. What do you have now? Jason was silent to my question. I was honestly disappointed with him for choosing his mother over me and then ultimately abandoning her. The Jason I once loved seems to no longer exist. But if I return to you, Tracy, you no longer have a place with us. I don't want you to contact us ever again. I hung up the phone and set it to block his calls. Later, Jason went to my parents' house, but my father, especially, had harsh words for him, and my father-in-law took him away. He was then assigned to a construction site far away. Surrounded by burly men at work, it seems unlikely he'll interfere with us again. Meanwhile, my mother-in-law, abandoned by Jason, lost her place and was rumored to be seen under a bridge. But that is no longer my concern. I'll be late coming home today because of my part-time job. Okay, thanks for letting me know. That's my line. Thank you, really. Since then, Kevin has emerged from his rebellious phase and engages in proper conversations with me. Through recent events, I've come to understand Kevin's feelings better. To respond to those feelings, I've been expressing my gratitude and apologies directly. Thanks to his response, our parent-child relationship has become closer. Jason's departure, ironically, made us closer as a family. I spent the day with Kevin, thankful for this, and smiling. My relationship with my father-in-law remains unchanged. I may want him as a successor, but I just want to see my dear daughter and grandson, he says, caring for us. My father-in-law was delighted when we recently went on a trip with my parents. I hope to maintain this good relationship with him. Years after the divorce, letters from Jason asking for reconciliation kept coming through my parents. I've been tearing them up without reading. Another letter from him? Looks like it. He still haven't given up. He should realize that giving up is the real path to happiness. He probably wants to regain something since he has nothing left. Let's hurry and have dinner. Today, Kevin, who has just graduated from college, is going to his first day of work as a successor in the company. He earned the employee's trust during his internship while he was a student. The office staff even mentioned how he's seen as a promising new employee. I'm proud of my son. Actually, I wanted to give this to you, mom. What is it? He handed me a beautiful box with an elegant pen inside. I bought this with the money I've been saving. I could work hard because of you. I was moved to tears in the morning. I want to continue living peacefully and closely as a family. And I want to be there for Kevin so he can always smile. I'll be careful not to be overbearing like someone we used to know.